Welcome to the webinar on economic justice and the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. This is Marilyn Harbour. I am a Senior Assistant Attorney General in the Tax and Finance section of the Oregon Department of Justice. And I co-chair the Economic Justice Committee of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section, which sponsors this program. Thank you for joining us. And we will hear from three distinguished panelists discussing the issues relating to economic, gender, and racial inequality in the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. At a time of great income and wealth inequality in this country, economic justice is at the forefront of our concerns as a committee. We believe in the, that the lawyers and other citizens in this country need to examine and understand how our laws, such as the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, affect inequality in, and what we can do to achieve better economic justice. Our three panelists uh, are two lawyers and one economist. First, we will hear from Alexandra Thornton, also goes by Alex. She is the Senior Director of Tax Policy at the Center for American Progress. And she's a member of the Center's economic policy team. She writes and speaks on tax and fiscal policy issues related to tax reform, individual and business taxation, tax administration, and the tax legislative process. She, Alex draws from nearly 10 years as tax counsel to a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance, as well as extensive experience in nonprofit management and private law practice. She holds a JD from the University of Virginia and a bachelor's degree in business administration from the College of William and Mary. Our second panelist will be Derek Hamilton. Derek is a pioneer and internationally recognized scholar in the field of stratification economics, which fuses social science methods to examine the causes, consequences, and remedies of racial, gender, ethnic, tribal, nativity, et cetera, inequality in education, economic, and health outcomes. His work involves crafting and implementing an innovative routes and policies that break down social hierarchy, empower people, and move society towards greater equity, inclusion, and civic participation. Professor Hamilton's uh, Scholarship and practice aligns closely with the work and objectives of the John Glenn College of Public Affairs and the Ohio State University Kerwin Institute for the study of race and ethnicity. In addition to serving as Kerwin's executive director, Professor Hamilton holds a primary faculty appointment in the Glenn College of Public Affairs with courtesy appointments in the Department of Economics and Sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences. Professor Hamilton was born and raised in the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, New York. He is a graduate of Oberlin College and earned a PhD in economics from the University of North Carolina. He completed postdoctoral appointments at the University of Michigan and serves as an advisor to several nonprofit organizations. He's frequently cited in media. He's written extensively, TED Talks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I believe he made an appearance on the 60 Minutes TV program. So we, uh, we will look forward to hearing from Derek. The third panelist is Francine Lippmann. Francine is the William S. Boyd Professor of Law at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. She brings an exceptional record as an accountant, lawyer, teacher, and a scholar. After working as a CPA in an international accounting firm and as the chief financial officer for a chain of retail jewelry stores, Professor Lippmann turned to law where she serves as the editor-in-chief of the UC Davis Law Review and was recognized as an outstanding law student and member of the Order of the Coif. Following a similarly stellar record in NYU's graduate tax law program where she was a tax law review scholar 
She practiced law with Omel v. Omel Vinnie and Myers LLP and Irel and Manella LLP. Professor Lippman is an elected member of the American Law Institute, the American College of Tax Counsel, and the American Bar Foundation, and an editor and former committee chair for the tax section of the American Bar Association. In 2016, Governor Brian Sandoval appointed um, Professor Littman to serve as a tax commissioner. The commissioners in Nevada serve, uh, they supervise the overall administration and operations of the Nevada Department of Taxation. Professor Littman has written extensively on tax and accounting issues for legal journals, including the Wisconsin Law Review, Florida Tax Review, Virginia Tax Review, SMU Law Review, Nevada Law Journal, American University Law Review, uh, American University Law Review, Harvard Environmental Law Review, and Harvard Latino Law Review, Harvard Journal on Legislation, The Tax Lawyer, The Practical Tax Lawyer, and Tax Notes. So, we'll look forward to hearing from Professor Littman. I think we are ready to begin. So, Alex, if you would begin your presentation. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'll be painting the bigger picture and covering general economic inequality in the TCJA. Um, and some of this material may be a little bit duplicative of the uh, material that we covered in a webinar last year. Um, it'll take a year or more before the IRS has the actual data available for 2018 and after, but um, there is definitely significant new material in this presentation. Now, to really understand inequality and the TCJA requires looking back a few decades because TCJA significantly worsened a problem uh, that began developing much earlier. It's also important to, view, to view this subject in the larger context of overall fiscal policy and economic policy. And finally, it's important to understand the difference between income and wealth or net worth and the relationship between them because that's intimately connected with the inequality that we see we saw before TCJA that was exacerbated by the TCJA. So, of course, income, as we all know, is the flow of money received by a person uh, in the course of, say, a year. It's wages and salaries, but it can also be income from investments and also income from pensions or Social Security or what have you. Wealth is net worth. It's, the, it's static. It's the value of all assets minus, minus debts owed. And um, the more income you have, and this is the relationship between the two, the more income a person has, the more likely they are to have some left over to make, to save or make investments that will help them build for the future. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, we're going to start by um, looking back a few decades before TCJA, and that's what this first slide does. It shows the strong growth in incomes at the top from 1962 to 2014, the most recent data that I was able to get. Um, the strong growth in incomes of the top 1%, um, it, it's starting in the 1980s, that's the red line. And the blue line is the bottom 50%, which you can see is relatively flat. Next slide. So this chart shows how that divergence in incomes affected who received what share of total national income as the years passed. You can see that the top 1%, the red line, gained an ever larger share of national income, far surpassing the share of the bottom 50%. So uh, it's also important to know when you look at this that an increasing share of the income of the wealthy consists of income from capital capital gains and dividends and so forth. Next slide. So these, the following two char charts will show where we ended up in 2016 as a result of this. That's the year before the enactment of TCJA. As you can see in this chart, uh, the top 1% received nearly a quarter of all income in 2016, while the bottom 90% received only 50% of all national income. 
And note that this includes all forms of income. I haven't excluded any here. It's self-employment and business income, capital gains, interest income, income from government programs. Next slide. So this chart is the more striking one and the more revealing one. It shows who ends up holding the most wealth in 2016. And here you can see that the top 1% holds nearly 40% of all wealth, close to twice as much as the wealth held by the bottom 90%. That's that 23% you see in this chart. So this raises serious questions about the extent to which tax policy contributed to this income and wealth inequality and what should be done about it. And at the same time, it raises concerns about the ability of a large portion of the population at the lower end to afford an education, to save for retirement, and take other steps to improve their economic situation and participate in the economy. Now, there are many explanations for the soaring incomes and wealth at the very top, particularly over the last couple of decades. Economists um, often point to economic rents, which is basically returns uh, to your business activity that are considered um, beyond what you would expect in a normally competitive uh, market. Um, maybe for one reason or another, you know, there's no competition. So over this period, there's been a, an increasing concentration in industries like the pharmaceutical industry, for example, and that concentration means more power over pricing, over politics and policy. And also there's been a proliferation of patents and copyrights, especially in hard to uh, copy digital products. Um, and it's enabled a small number of owners, both individuals and corporations, to achieve a much higher return than would be expected in a normally competitive market. So these things may contribute to that income growth at the top. And whatever the reasons for the rise in incomes at the top, the important thing to know is that it was accompanied over the same period by a number of changes in the tax system that contributed to income in, to inequality. So you can go to the next slide. So in the decades leading up to TCJA, many taxes were lowered on the types of income that high income people received and on wealth. There was a lower, the marginal top marginal tax rate was lowered. Uh, the preference for capital gains and dividends was made permanent. Um, there became lower effective tax rates for pass-through business income. And of course, there was no tax on unrealized gain um, and stepped up basis. Those existed before and continued. And the estate tax was made weaker. And so this enabled the wealthy to save more from their income and build up even more wealth, contributing to wealth inequality. So um, uh, let's go to uh, the next slide, but I, I want to point out that even as that was happening, wages were stagnating for the average working American, preventing them from saving and building up wealth. Um, so in this slide, uh, even before TCJA, you can see that the preference for capital gains and dividends alone was heavily skewed to the wealthy because they own the types of assets, mainly stock, that yield capital gain and dividend income. So. This chart is showing how in 2016, millionaires were the primary beneficiaries of this tax break. Um, it applied to more than half of the income of people with incomes over 10 million, as you can see that 53% there. Next slide. But the failure to tax unrealized gains until later, if at all, is an even greater concern for our fiscal system. When you look at this pie chart, you can see that in 2016, the top 1% held 62% of unrealized capital gains, while the bottom 90% had just 7%. So leaving, leaving unrealized gains um, completely out of the tax calculation until assets are sold or transferred, which may never happen, uh, creates the impression that our tax code is more progressive than it really is. And it actually moves us away from the notion of a tax code that taxes according to ability to pay. So, and it's important also to realize that the wealthy in reality have many ways to access the supposedly unrealized wealth without incurring tax consequences. So just an example would be they can invest in homes and art, antique cars and other consumable assets that increase in value, or they can borrow against it. Um, possibly even deducting the interest um, against other income to the extent that they can make it appear that the, the loan was business related. 
So with the combination of the changing composition of income at the top to more capital income and higher net worth, and the weakening of taxes in these forms of income and wealth over that same period, the result is basically a huge structural deficit in the defect in the tax system and the failure to tax massive accumulations of wealth. And as I said, this has moved the tax system away from taxing according to ability to pay. But more importantly for our subject today, it's lost revenue. And, and the lost revenue puts more pressure um, on cutting programs, you know, to cut programs. And those programs that the federal government uh, engages in largely help those at the lower end of the income scale. So this is why I'm saying it's important to look at the fiscal system as a whole. Now let's go to the next slide. So TCJA basically exacerbated this scenario. Instead of correcting the problem, it exacerbated it. Um, instead of a true tax reform that would have attempted to fix the structural defect of the tax code and modernize it to fit the reality of the income of the wealthy today, it exacerbated the problem. And as has been documented and analyzed, TCJA did give enormous tax cuts to the wealthy, further increasing their ability to accumulate ever more wealth. And not only that, the cost of these tax cuts, which is $1.9 trillion over 10 years, according to CBO, um, will re could result in an even more regressive fiscal system, as I was just mentioning. So let's go to the next slide. Just to emphasize this point, this chart shows the relative sizes of the TCJA tax cuts in 2018 at different levels of income. And I think the picture speaks for itself. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and another, uh, this is another way of looking at it because the corporate tax cut was one of the biggest tax cuts and it was, um, made permanent, whereas, as you know, the individual tax cuts were not, most of them. So who, benef who benefits from a corporate tax rate cut? Well, this chart shows, um, and, you know, it's basically it heavily benefits the top um, 5%, and in particularly the top 1%, which is the part of the last bar in orange. So um, now um, the next two chart charts will sort of confirm this point in another way. Um, next slide, please. This is in 2025, the year before the individual tax cuts expire. And it shows the percent change in after-tax income as a result of TCJA that year. So as you can see, taxpayers with incomes of a million or more enjoy an increase in, an increase in after-tax income of almost 3% on average, while those with incomes of 50% or less have only a 1% or lower increase in after-tax incomes. Next slide. Now here we see the same picture, but in 2027, after the individual income tax cuts have, ex have expired, but the corporate tax cut is still in place and it looks dramatically different. Of course, um, barring any further tax law changes, the TCJA will become much more regressive by the end of the decade. So in 2027, low-income households will actually owe more in taxes than they would have under old law. And that's largely due to the expiration of the individual tax cuts, but the regressivity will become even worse over the following decade and beyond, even at, um, given that TCJA adopted um, the chain CPI as an inflation index which of course leads to smaller adjustments and um, affects people's tax liabilities that way. Um, last slide. So um, here, I'm not gonna go over this in detail um, because uh, I think Francine um, will be doing that, but um, I just wanted to once again, put forward the t major TCJA provisions affecting working and middle income families the elimination of personal exemptions for a time, um, the increase in the standard deduction, the child tax credit, um, which was not made fully refundable, though it was doubled, um, and then the phase outs increased so that higher income people were able to get the child tax credit, but not lower fully, um, and so forth. You can see them there, and um, I'll end my part now so that um, Derek can continue with his portion. Thank, Thank you, Alan.
Please, Derek, uh, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, well, um, definitely gratitude for that, Alex, and uh, thank you, Marilyn, and uh, my fellow co-panelist, Francine, uh, for allowing me to share the stage with you all and talk about this important issue. And uh, let me let me uh, say one minor correction from the introduction. I was not on 60 Minutes that I know of, uh, but PBS. It was PBS NewsHour. Oh. Oh, all <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so I'm going to begin with a quote from a brief that I prepared with Michael Linden at Groundwork Collaborative um, for the Roosevelt Institute where the brief was entitled, The Hidden Rules of Race Embedded in the New Tax Law. And basically my presentation is gonna try to placate the tax cut and so-called jobs acts in a frame of political economy and race. So here's the quote, the federal tax code is one of the most powerful tools of economic policy making. It can incentivize, it can subsidize or discourage certain behaviors or activities. It can impose economic burdens or it can relieve them. It can provide an implicit check on the outsized power, including political power. The federal tax code, in other words, houses some of, more, some of the most critical rules that govern our economy. As such, it is also home to a set of hidden racial rules that through intention or neglect, provide opportunities to some communities and create barriers to others. So some historical background is that is presented in an Economic Policy Institute report entitled The Productivity Pay Gap, which vividly displays that over the last 45 years, all of America's increasing, rising prosperity have essentially gone to the wealthy, the elite, and the upper middle class. Despite our continued trend towards decrease, increasing productivity, worker wages have been roughly flat, and the promise trickled down from a neoliberal supply side, supply side economics has never been realized. This, is, this was not always the case though. The report demonstrates that prior to 1973, there was a lockstep one-to-one -one ratio in which real wages increased with, with productivity simultaneously. But after 1973, we got this clam effect where productivity continued, but real wages became flat. So I'd like to also point out that there's nothing new or radical about a concept that I'm gonna try to elaborate on a little bit, and that is economic rights. 75 years ago, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt framed his 1944 State of the Union address and his proposed economic bill of rights. He called for, quote, physical security, economic security, social security, and moral security. And his first article of this second bill of rights included a guaranteed right to employment for all. In contrast to an economic rights frame, uh, a free market or so-called free market frame emphasizes deregulation, tax cuts, and tax incentives to cajole or bribe an already record profit earning private sector to provide more jobs and rebuild the nation's crumbling infrastructure. And this is done under the lure that this will deliver innovation a dynamic economy that would trickle down to all of us. But instead, as the EPI report demonstrates and as Alex charts from the last presentation demonstrates that at least since 1973, we've had economic and political concentration at the top. The free market approach also frames poverty and inequalities as deficiencies internal to the poor and blacks themselves. And we do this framing with a stigmatization based on race and anti-blackness that strategically uses political fodder like welfare queens and deadbeat, deadbeat dads to implement harsh and punitive control on the underclass. Blacks become the symbolism by which we define a surplus population that's characterized as persistently unemployed and unemployable, a source of urban crime and malice, and whose subsistence needs are deemed a drain on fiscal budgets. This fuels the rationale for austerity policy. If behavioral modification, particularly with regards to personal and human capital investments is a central issue, why should we fund government agencies and programs which at best misallocate resources to irresponsible individuals and at worst create dependencies that further fuel irresponsible behavior? So we end up with 
state and public private interventions that attempt to leverage private and charitable resources to manage or incentivize so-called defective black and brown people to get an education and become more employable rather than addressing the resource deprivation and perhaps discriminatory educational and labor market conditions that they face in the first place. We situate the market as a great, efficient, self-regulating, colorblind arbiter of our worth and the solution to all our problems, economic or otherwise. What we exclude from this narrative is the role of power and capital, how power and capital are self-reinforcing and without government intervention, they generate iterative cycles of both stratification and inequality. Basically, without capital, we lock in inequality. We use words like choice and freedom to describe the benefits of the market, but choice is an illusion. If an individual lacks basic needs like a job, like adequate income, like shelter, like food, or health care, it is literally wealth that gives us choice, freedom, and optionality. And then as was presented in the US, we know the top 10% of household owns nearly 80% of our nation's wealth, and more specifically, the top one tenth of a percent, according to research from Zayas and Zuckman, own about as much of our nation's wealth as the entire bottom 90%. America's wealth distribution is driven by an obscene concentration amongst a white, predominantly white wealthy class that's unprecedented since the Great Depression. Still, race is a stronger predictor of one's wealth than class itself. The absolute racial wealth gap in terms of the median exceeds $150,000, where the typical black household has only about 10 cents for every dollar held by the typical white household. The tax cuts and jobs law is a partisan game changer that is gonna accelerate this inequality or is already accelerating this inequality and racial economic disparities in at least four different ways. First, the benefits accrue disproportionately to high income households who are overwhelmingly white and underwhelmingly black. And this regressive skew gets worse over time, as Alex pointed out, by 2027, fully 83% of the tax cuts will flow to the top 1%, while the bottom 60% of earners will on average actually experience tax increases compared to before the law was enacted. Second, the tax law privileges existing wealth holders. Rather than providing avenues to create new wealth, and Blacks generationally have been denied the ability to access and pass down wealth. Um, so for example, the centerpiece of the tax law is the massive tax cuts to corporation, reducing their tax rates from 35 to 25 to 21 percent. This $1.3 trillion windfall over the next decade, it's gonna primarily benefit existing shareholders. Corporations are already using these windfall tax savings to repurchase shares of their own stocks. Those, those stock buybacks benefit existing shareholders. The top 20% of Americans own about 92% of all shareholder wealth. But what's also obvious is that this is not a group that includes Black and Latinx populations. Third, by limiting state and local tax deductions, the law is gonna push states and localities to rely more heavily on fees and fines as a source of revenue, which is also gonna disproportionately increase the debt and strip the wealth from Black communities who lack economic and political power to shield themselves against these regressive forms of, of, of income sources. Um, they will also extend a reach of a broken criminal justice system that causes enormous economic and civic damage within communities of color. And of course, when confronted with an expensive legal system, Black and Latinx populations have far less income and even far further less wealth to address an exig exigent situation. Finally, the enormous revenue loss to the tune of nearly $2 trillion over the next over this decade, coupled with the limitation of state and local tax deductions, will undermine a public sector. And we know that the public sector and undermining of the public sector is a particular burden on Black American workers and Black American communities. The sad irony is this budget-busting tax cut in a political context that overemphasizes austerity it will accelerate the impact of an already 
demised dim dimension of a public sector that provides vital services and employment, which disproportionately is ultimately going to hurt black and brown communities. In some, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act favors the rich and powerful few, with, and it will specifically prey upon black and brown communities. But rather than imposing pressure on state and localities to rely on fees and fines to balance local budgets, what the federal government should be looking to do is end mass incarceration, especially for nonviolent offenders. And we should also be trying to hold police criminally and civilly responsible for abusive police practices. Um, and then rather than cajoling and bribing an already record profit earning private sector with tax incentives, the federal government should also be looking to initiate the economic rights spelled out by Roosevelt for a guaranteed job with economic security of a living wage and other worker amenities that invest in our public physical and human infrastructure. I'm not talking about workfare or an employer of last resort program, but a viable alternative to undesirable low pay, low benefits, and poor working conditions. Moreover, the jobs would address our 21st century physical and human capital infrastructure needs, including our increasing vulnerability to quote natural disaster resulting from unnatural climate change, which all require a substantial public investment. To establish a more civically engaged and better functioning democracy, a wealth tax could break up our nation's dysfunctional concentration of both economic and political power at the top. And to address our extreme concentration of wealth, we could implement a baby bonds program to establish a universal birthright to capital, a privilege that generally is reserved only for those that are born into wealth. We could provide all Americans with a capital foundation to build wealth and the asset security that comes along with it. Baby bonds would complement an economic right to old age pension like Social Security and provide a more comprehensive Social Security program designed to provide capital finance from cradle all the way to grave, regardless of the race and family position in which an individual is born. The average account could be seated at birth with about $25,000, and these accounts could gradually rise upwards to $60,000 for babies born into the poorest family. And when that child reaches adulthood, the accounts could be used for some asset enhancing activity like financing a debt-free university education, a down payment to purchase a home, or some seed capital to start a new business. With approximately 4 million babies born each year, the program would cost crudely about $100 billion and would constitute about 2% of annual federal expenditures and be far less than the 500 plus billion dollars that we already spend on asset promotion and far, far less than the $1.3 trillion tax cut and so-called job act that we recently passed. At issue is not the amount of the allocation that's already spent on asset promotion, but to whom it's distributed. Currently, the top 1% of earners, those earning above a million dollars, receive about one third of the entire allocation, while the bottom 60% of earners receive only about 5%. If the federal asset promoting budget were allocated in a more progressive manner, federal policies could be transformative for all Americans. To the extent that our dramatic inequality is so entrenched, it's as much a problem of politics as it is a problem of economics. Our existing tax policies, they privilege existing wealth over the establishment of new wealth. Well, that's a choice. Financial behavior and financial literacy, they become practically useless for households with little to no finances to manage in the first place. This is why I advocate for a birthright to capital. A bootstraps narrative framed in the politics of personal responsibility, which emphasize individual agency, particularly self-investments and education as a pathway to upward mobility and efficient social distribution. Well, that might literally be bad for people's health, particularly black people's health. Uh, there are physical and psychological costs of stigma and ironically exerting individual agency in discriminatory and racially stigmatized environment particularly for those that pose a competitive threat to the preferred position of a socially dominant group. We need an honest and sobering confession 
of the historical and ongoing sins of our nation, including slavery in which Blacks literally served as capital for a white plantation owning class, sharecropping, white capping, where we had white violence to outright steal Black property, a Jim Crow South, and the exclusion of Blacks from New Deal and post-World War policies that built an asset white, a white asset-based middle class. An authentic analysis would counter our current neoliberal frame that characterizes Black, Brown, and poor people in general as undeserving, and instead it would pave a way for narratives that more accurately frame inequality as grounded in resource deprivation. However, acknowledgement and apology alone would be empty if not accompanied with some form of material redress. We need a bold, transformative, race and gender conscious economic bill of rights that re redefines our nation's economic well being to incorporate things like morality, sustainability, and common humanity. Policies where public options directly compete with and crowd out private options that are inferior that do not ensure universal quality things like health care, housing, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility without the psychological and physical threat of detention or bodily harm at the hands of a state-sanctioned terror because someone's social identity is linked to a vulnerable or stigmatized group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that I don't need to remind the audience that if you have questions, note them and uh, we will come back to the question section at the end of the program. And so we'll proceed now. Francine, would you like to give us a more in-depth look at the effect of the various provisions of the Tax Cuts Jobs Act? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Marilyn. And I, I would like to thank the ABA uh, Civil Rights and Social Justice section for sponsoring this program, uh, as well as there's another group, Marilyn, isn't it ABA Public Service or Public Interest Law? Well, the Public Interest Division, Division. is also sponsoring, and of course, the state and local government section, the Attorney General's uh, and Department of Justice Attorneys Committee, which I co-chair as well, uh, also has participated in this. So it, it has a, a broad interest. Great. Well, thank you all for putting this together. And I greatly appreciate the participation of my co-panelists. And I do want to encourage the audience to ask questions. We're going to have plenty of time at the end uh, for your Q&A. And I guess what I add to this program is uh, taking you down uh, into the weeds. And so in addition to being a law faculty member, uh, at UNLV, I also have participated for a number of years in quite a significant amount of pro bono work. Uh, I'm also very excited that at UNLV now we have a low income taxpayer clinic that literally works on the front lines of tax justice. Uh, with anti-poverty work. And I, I want to raise that because currently in America, our most effective anti-poverty programs are being delivered through the income tax system. That's why when we think about economic inequality and in, uh, income and wealth inequality, we think about the tax system because frankly, outside of the tax system, we have very little anti-poverty relief. Uh, the most significant anti-poverty -po program in the country is Social Security, but of course that targets seniors. Uh, and the, the next program is the Earned Income Tax Credit and the uh, Child Tax Credit, which are delivered through the income tax system. But as Derek Hamilton, Professor Hamilton has pointed out, it doesn't have to be delivered through the income tax system. So as we 
think about the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, because the individual provisions, most of the individual provisions are temporary, this gives us a great opportunity to be thinking about how, when these individual tax changes expire, maybe how we can do it better on a going forward basis. So that's why programs like this are so important to be thinking about these things critically. And as Derek uh, and Alex have pointed out in a holistic manner, not necessarily using the tax system, but perhaps thinking about the impact of the federal income tax system and Let's not forget about the state tax systems. What's interesting about the state tax systems is that uh, state tax systems predominantly raise their revenue in a very regressive manner. And that is one reason why the federal system needs to be so progressive to combat that. Well, let's now dive into the weeds of the TCJA. And as we've all said, most of the individual tax changes are temporary. And the reason for that is the budget. The decrease in the corporate tax rate cut was so significant um, that in order to make individual changes, they had to be temporary because we couldn't afford to pay for open-ended changes. There are some, however, permanent changes that uh, are in the uh, system, in the TCJA, that we need to think about critically. One that's quite interesting is that uh, the Affordable Care Act, as uh, many of you know, had a uh, penalty, a penalty that actually was appealed uh, up to the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. And Justice Roberts, writing the opinion, found that the penalty in the individual health care mandate was a tax and it was constitutional. Uh, so repealing that penalty actually saves about $314 billion. And when I first looked at this estimate, I thought, how could repealing a penalty that is a tax actually save money? And the reason it saves money is, in my opinion, a bit tragic because without this health care mandate, many individuals will not sign up for health care and therefore they won't get a refundable tax credit that's called the premium tax credit. So the premium tax credit is part of the Affordable Care Act to make health care affordable. It's a refundable credit that lower income individuals and middle income families qualify for to subsidize their health care. So what's interesting is without this, this stick, this tax penalty to make people have health care, we save money because, uh, or at least we save tax dollars because individuals aren't going to have health care and they're not going to use the subsidy. What's interesting about uh, repealing this mandate is that, and actually the mandate hasn't been repealed, just the, the tax, the penalty. And what's, I encourage all of you to read Justice Roberts' opinion because he lays out that the penalty is critically important in the ACA because if you are not going to allow insurance companies to price in pre-existing conditions, then the rational actor would of course get health insurance right before they need that uh, surgery. And so in order to make uh, affordable care work, 
healthcare work, you have to force everyone into the program, including healthy people and unhealthy people. And so you, the penalty forces people into the program because it costs them if they don't participate. But if you're gonna force people into the program, then for lower income families who can't afford it, we've gotta subsidize that. And so those three pieces work together to make the Affordable Care Act work. And the TCJA eliminated one of these components. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens to affordable care. Uh, and tragically, we want to make sure that low-income families understand that the premium tax credit still exists and that they should get health care and that they should utilize the premium tax credit. So that's a big change that's a permanent change. Uh, another permanent change is something that Alex mentioned, and that's the tax system is indexed. Many of the items are indexed for inflation. And that indexing, of course, helps with bracket creep so that if your salary goes up purely on an inflation component, you're not pushed into a new progressive tax rate. So we've been indexing the income tax system for inflation since the 70s, and they actually change, change the type of indexing we're use, using, which is a much slower inflation index. And so what that means and this is a permanent change, this saves $134 billion, and it saves it because certain anti-poverty programs like the Earned Income Tax Credit is not gonna increase as great, and the brackets aren't going to increase as great. The uh, other things that are indexed, for example, the standard, uh, the standard, uh, 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 exclusion amount is not going to be indexed. And so a number of items aren't going to be indexed and that actually saves money. And that's why once it's repealed, even though the old tax system is resurrected, it ends up hurting individuals compared to the old act because of this uh, inflation adjustment. Another permanent change is kind of interesting and that is section 529 plans, which are ways to say for college, uh, those can now be used up to $10,000 per year for K through 12 education. And what's interesting about that is that kind of subsidizes in a different way, private school. And so while I know uh, in my state, as well as other states, there's been a lot of uh, play with voucher programs this is a way that we're arguably subsidizing that through the tax system because 529 plans are not subject to income tax. The monies that are saved through a 529 for college, for higher education, are not subject to income tax. And when you pull it out, uh, it's not included in gross income. So now that can be used for K through 12 education. Another kind of interesting change that you might not think about its impact on low-income families is the tax form change. So as you may or may not know, um, a big part of the, the selling point of the TCJA was simplification. And by the way, pretty much across every aisle, across every population, people want tax simplification. You know, we've been looking for tax simplification forever and um, applaud any sort of form of simplification. However, uh, the postcard tax form clearly is not a way to achieve simplification. And I've been uh, preparing individual tax returns since the, uh, I'll date myself, the early 80s. And the Form 1040 has, as far as I can remember, pretty much looked the same. And 
this year for the first year ever uh, in a long many decades we have a brand new form 1040 which is a uh, half a page and basically what they did uh, was they took off a lot of the lines and they put them onto different forms so not only did that uh, make tax compliance uh, more complicated for preparers who've been using the old forms forever, but it actually in hindsight makes no sense. I looked at a statistic yesterday and 95% of all taxpayers electronically file. So nobody would send in a tax form in a, on a postcard that just makes no sense in the context of tax compliance. So shrinking it down is really not achieving simplification. And one of the things that it has done, I work on the front lines with a lot of low income taxpayers. What has happened is because so many of the lines are now on other forms and they created new forms for the offloading of these lines, many uh, tax preparers that are low income taxpayers go to charge by the form. So what has happened is I think this has increased the cost of tax compliance. And now with the complexity of the new form, I don't blame tax preparers for charging for that, but this hurts a low income taxpayers, especially individuals who low income individuals who use the earned income tax credit are more likely to go to a paid preparer. We just increase their cost of compliance. So that change and what's interesting is I just saw the new 2019 tax form, they're already moving in the direction of expanding it. So I just saw the new draft is now two thirds of a page and has added many lines back. So that sort of change just in hindsight doesn't make sense. And I hope we can think more critically about the impact of those sort of changes on a going forward basis. So now let's look at tax rates. So one of the discussions early on was they were going to eliminate some of the progressive tax rate brackets. Well, that doesn't really achieve simplification. And so they ended up not doing that, but I think it's important simplification by changing the number of progressive tax rates isn't achieving simplification. So as you can see, pretty much across the board, the ordinary income tax rates did decrease, except, of course, the lowest tax bracket. And so we still have a 10% rate. That rate did not go down. And so that's one place where we could have perhaps uh, decreased that rate versus at the higher end. Uh, the brackets from 2017 to 2018 are not perfectly aligned, but this decrease in the ordinary income tax rates did end up costing uh, almost over a, uh, over a trillion dollars. And what's interesting about this, going back to what uh, Alex has said, is that the capital gains tax rate did not was not changed at all and so that could have been an opportunity to raise revenue to do some other things they could have increased it um, and then targeted better targeted income and wealth inequality another thing that they have been doing over time and and alex uh spoke about this briefly is the estate and gift tax exclusion has been increased significantly and so prior to the tcja the estate and gift tax exclusion was just over five million that was doubled and by the way this is indexed for inflation and when you index uh, 11 million dollars for inflation it goes up quite a bit uh, if you're a married couple that uh, individual exclusion is portable 
So if one spouse doesn't use it, the other spouse can use it. And so this is a, this means an enormous amount of wealth at death is not subject to any estate tax. And by the way, these exclusions are after amounts that go to charity. They are after amounts that go, an unlimited amount that can go to your spouse. What we have seen in the year since the TCJA is that individual charitable donations have decreased. And of course, we can't say exactly why that happens, but my guess is the estate and gift tax exclusion increase has something to do with it. In addition, as I mentioned, uh, in addition to the individual tax rate decreases, now this is simplification, arguably, that uh, we, could, we can uh, celebrate to a certain extent, and that is that the standard deduction amounts just about doubled uh, for all of the different filing statuses. So in 2017, single standard deduction amount was scheduled to be 6,500, that jumped up to 12,000. Head of household, you can see, went up to 18,000. By the way, these amounts are indexed for inflation and now using the new slower indexing, but these amounts are already for married filing joint is up to, for 2019, $24,400. Uh, I do want to mention these additional amounts. So you get an additional amount in your standard deduction if you're aged kind of like a fine wine. And what does age mean? Well, that's 65 or older and or blind. Uh, what is interesting is when uh, Congress was working on the TCJA, as you know, it becomes a, a race between the House bill and the Senate bill. And in some of the early bills, they eliminated this additional amount for the standard deduction. And I work with um, the National Federation of the Blind and they were lobbying pretty heavily to get this additional amount to keep it in the uh, final act. Well, they weren't getting the attention of Congress, but uh, then the uh, AARP jumped on the bandwagon and uh, lobbied pretty heavily and the additional amount was kept and is now in law, so they didn't eliminate uh, the additional amount. So with these much, much higher standard deduction amounts, the last statistic I saw was 90% of all taxpayers are using the standard deduction and not itemizing their deductions. So that means your charitable donations are not being subsidized unless you exceed the standard deduction amount. By the way, the charitable deduction uh, was increased, the limit, charitable deductions you can give up to, used to historically give up to 50% of your adjusted gross income to charity it was capped, and then any excess amount could be carried forward. That cap was increased to 60%. So even with that increase, we didn't see an increase in charitable donations. Now, there was some uh, misunderstanding. A lot of people thought, well, with this additional standard deduction amount, then I should have a decrease and I should really see a big refund. But personal dependency exemptions were completely repealed. And so for fam so for example, for a family of four, husband uh, and spouse or wife and spouse and two kids, they were previously getting a personal dependency exemption amount of over 16,000. So the 12,000 increase in their standard deduction amount is not made up for by this uh, loss of personal dependency exemptions. So it, it, we're seeing uh, an impact on families, especially families with a lot of children. Uh, although 
And it's complicated. See, it's not the sort of simplification that uh, the postcard warrants because the child tax credit was increased, as Alex mentioned, um, but it was increased in a way that is complicated. So the child tax credit is a partially refundable credit. And what that means is that um, if your income tax liability is reduced to zero, if you have a refundable credit like the earned income tax credit, which is like a subsidy because you have to have wages and children generally to get it, uh, the child tax credit is partially refundable. While they increase the child tax credit from $1,000 to $2,000, they did not fully make it refundable. And that is a, a lot of individuals are arguing we should do that. So they made it only refundable up to $1,400. And again, that was kind of a push at the end to get it passed. But something that a lot of people don't understand, the child tax credit is really based upon earnings it's based similar to the earned income tax credit it's based upon earnings and children qualifying children and so if you don't have earned income you don't get the child tax credit if you are a lower income person and so your federal income tax liability is zeroed out you only get the refundable credit up to fourteen hundred dollars so for some individuals, this wasn't an increase at all. What's interesting is they increased the thresholds for phase out. It was $110,000 for married filing joint when it started to phase out. They increased that to 400,000, which is well over certainly middle income or low income taxpayers. And so for a lot of high income households at the 400,000 range, they previously did not get any child tax credit. And now they get $2,000 per kid that they weren't getting before. And some of the lower income households didn't get any increase. So this is not helped with income inequality. Uh, what they also did was, this is a, a real targeted anti-immigrant provision and specifically targeted, I would argue, against uh, people of color, is that in order to get the child tax credit, you now have to have a social security number. Uh, previously, because we want to subsidize families with children who are paying income taxes and we want them in the tax system, we don't want to chill people from filing, uh, we want to encourage tax compliance. Uh, if you had a social security number or an individual tax bar identification number, you could qualify for the child tax credit. Well, in the House bill, uh, the bill required at least one parent to have a social security number. The Senate bill uh, is the current law, and that is that the child has to have the social security number. And so this is certainly hurting different populations. And I can tell you on the front lines of tax justice, I have seen many families who are legally present in this country, mom and dad, who are working, uh, trying to uh, provide uh, a living for their families and their kids don't have social security numbers. Why? Our immigration system is way backlogged and many of them can't afford attorneys. And so they lose the child tax credit, even though they're legally present and they're working with authorization, they don't get the earned income tax credit, which in some cases I've seen could be over $5,000 and they don't get the child tax credit. And so this is really a hardship relying on social security numbers. Previously, you used to be able to retroactively amend your tax return once you got the social security number uh that 
that has been changed. And so I'm seeing families who don't get this benefit, even though uh, they're hardworking, uh, they're paying taxes, and they're trying to uh, become part of, they're trying to naturalize. So individuals who don't have a social security number don't otherwise qualify for the child tax credit. They created a new credit that's $500, so significantly less than the $1,000 child tax credit or the $2,000 increase, the historical child tax credit or the $2,000 current child tax credit. For this provision, you don't need a social security number, but it's not refundable and it also phases out at the same higher levels that the child tax credit. There were no changes to the earned income tax credit. And as uh, my uh, colleagues, uh, Tony and Fonti, uh, in the article, one of the handouts, uh, he's a, a, a critical race theorist and tax professor, tax law professor at University of Pittsburgh. He's written several books and has just written one of the handouts that talks about gender inequality in the tax system. And he mentions the significant marriage penalty in the earned income tax credit. And another problem with the earned income tax credit that we could fix is that single wage earners that don't have children are the only population that we actually tax into poverty because the amount of the earned income tax credit that they get is so small. And that's something uh, actually has had bipartisan support in the past, but we didn't see that in the TCJA. We didn't see any changes to the earned income tax credit. So we're seeing some uh, discrimination here against immigrants uh, who are trying in the pipeline. We also, uh, as Professor Infanti points out, we see a marriage penalty, which we often uh, see as impacting women because as Ed McCaffrey has written in his seminal book, Taxing Women, Women, because of the uh, gender wage gap, are often thought of as uh, the second worker, and so their income is typically subject to the higher progressive tax rates and the marriage penalty. Uh, interesting, Dorothy Brown, who's at Emory, a law professor, she's written about the fact that uh, the marriage penalty really impacts African-American families because they are more likely to have equal income. The marriage bonus in our income tax system basically benefits typically white families who have one wage earner, higher income, one wage earner families where they get a marriage bonus. Marriage penalty typically impacts families where the workers both have uh, the similar uh, income, and so it's two wage earner families, and that is disproportionately families of color. Um, and that is all I have, and so hopefully some of you have asked some questions. I know this has been a quick overview, and there's a lot of information in the TCJA. It's sweeping tax reform. Uh, we didn't touch at all upon one of the big counter proposals to the drop in the corporate tax rate cut, and that is the section 199 cap A, 20% uh, uh, net profit deduction. And I know Jason O oh from UCLA has recently testified before Congress and he had a, a chart that demonstrated that the that benefit basically goes to households that are at a million dollars or higher. Alex might have some more information on that. But uh, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to help you help us think critically about on a going forward basis, how can we make the 
tax system and our uh, financial justice reform more equitable. And here's my contact information. I'm very good at responding to emails, so I encourage any and all of you to contact me with any questions directly or uh, any thoughts or comments on this presentation. So I'll turn it back to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Fr Francine. Excellent information. Uh, while we're waiting for the questions to come through, I will begin by asking, I guess all of you, but someone jump in. How did the tax refunds and the tax due for the first year of tax compliance under the TCGA work for taxpayers? So I'll start off and talk about that, uh, Marilyn. So what's interesting, if you think back, uh, there was a lot of confusion after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act first went into effect. And that is because, as we know, it really was signed into law at the very end of 2017. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but it, it, time flies. And everybody was uh, trying to figure out what to do, including, not surprisingly, the IRS, because they were charged with trying to implement sweeping tax reform immediately to hit the ground running. Um, and so the big issue became withholding, right? Everybody was trying to think about withholding tables and Congress was really pushing the IRS to do, get that out quickly so that people could feel it in their paychecks. And so the government was scrambling, trying to figure this all out, and they put out new withholding tables pretty quickly, but not until February or so. And then those withholding tables we're trying to help people see the tax cut in their paychecks, so arguably they weren't withholding as much, perhaps for some individuals as they should have. And the IRS went on a, a very uh, proactive campaign, and I have a, a radio talk show called Tax Talk Tuesdays, and we kept telling people, do a paycheck checkup, do a paycheck checkup. And the IRS was tweeting about it. So they wanted taxpayers to do a paycheck checkup. Well, low and middle income taxpayers are just trying to get to work, right? And get their kids to school and, and get food on the table, let alone do a paycheck checkup. So many of them didn't. And then when they came to the 2019, the beginning of the first impact of the Tax Cuts Act, they expected a big refund because they were told they have this big tax cut. But many of them didn't get a big refund. And in fact, the statistics are that basically the tax refunds, the average tax refund was 2% less than the prior year. Well, that doesn't mean they didn't get a tax cut, but maybe they got more during the year. Well, getting more during the year isn't such a bad thing, but a lot of these lower income individuals at the beginning of the year, they might have an increase in their health care premium. They might have had an increase in their state tax because the states are piggybacking on this. And so they didn't really see much in their paycheck. And so there was a lot of frustration and backlash. They didn't get the tax cut and people were saying, we should have done a paycheck checkup. But I think it's, it's a bigger burden on taxpayers who are just sitting there and expecting that the system you know, should be self-accommodating, which it isn't. So I do encourage everyone, do a paycheck checkup. And the IRS has a, a great online program for you to do that. And Thank you. Francine mentioned already that we're seeing a reduction in charitable donations and uh, she linked it to the estate tax. That, that's a, another feature. I, I'd say, um, 
politically the, the tax cuts were designed in a way to get more regressive over time. So, you know, some of the effects, I guess we'll see even worse at, as time goes on. Um, but then there were a lot of media accounts of corporate stock buybacks. Um, and that framed in the context of what was uh, narrated of, of, of the second part of the description of the thing, tax cuts and jobs acts, was that this notion that corporations were gonna use their tax savings to increase uh, the benefits that go to workers, both through hiring as, as well as higher wages. Um, but there was at least uh, several news accounts of uh, corporations not using that windfall for uh, enhancing worker benefits, but rather uh, to enrich shareholders and increase their corporate power altogether by doing these corporate buybacks. I also think that perhaps a lot of taxpayers look at their net refund and that often because of uh, paid tax preparers, it's often net of the fee that comes right out of their refund. And so maybe tax compliance was higher. So folks don't have, because everything's so computerized, they don't have a real good sense of what their overall tax liability is. And frankly, with the new truncated tax form, it was even harder to figure that out. Right, was there any change to child care subsidies? Uh, I'll answer that one. Um, no, there, there really wasn't directly, but there was in the sense that um, because of interaction with other tax provisions, um, basically the child care deduction credit that it currently exists in the law, which by the way is, is rather paltry and doesn't even begin to cover the actual cost of child care in this country, which varies dramatically across the country to as high as $16,000 a year in some states. But um, in any event, that $5,000 child and dependent tax credit in the law, while it wasn't changed directly, it became less valuable to people at the low end of the spectrum, even as people at the higher and higher income levels could still fully use it because they were more likely to itemize. So the answer is, uh, no, it wasn't uh, reduced or changed directly, but the value of it was decreased for lower income individuals. All right, uh, a question for Derek. There is a lot of discussion in the media these days about universal basic income and our Economic Justice Committee has actually put on a program for the ABA on that subject. How does that compare with your baby bonds concept? Well, baby bonds is really aimed at assets and wealth. Um, UBI, as described, is about income. Um, there's also the concern that UBI, the universal nature of it, is that it might be more regressive as an unintended consequence of, of uh, putting direct income into people's hands. You can imagine that those that are at the low end of the income spectrum will almost by definition have to consume because they're a subsistence population, whereas those that are at the upper end of the spectrum, well, they'll have the ability to take that and invest it, reinvest it to further enhance their wealth. So um, as um, I think was pointed out in both of the other presentations, that uh, putting money in the hands of poor people is not the problem, um, but if we do it in a way that does, does it where <laughs> Uh, everybody gets the same amount. It has the impact of being put inflationary, um, generally driving up the price level, but also inequality enhancing. So I like the basic income part of it, but not the universal part. All right, thank you. Um, Francine, you, at the end of your presentation, you were talking about the EITC marriage penalty. When you say penalty, could you be more specific as to what that is? Certainly. So a marriage penalty uh, is typically calculated when you uh, perhaps you have two single individuals and so you calculate their tax liability or with respect to the earned income tax credit, maybe their EITC benefit if they had remained unmarried and then you calculate it 
assuming they got married, and a marriage penalty is by merely getting married, their benefit decreases. A marriage bonus is you calculate the two individual tax liabilities, and then you calculate it again once they get married, and then the liability actually goes down. And so that's a marriage bonus or a marriage penalty. The EITC has an um, inherent marriage penalty in it. And as a result, uh, there are some low-income households where they don't get married. They're cohabitating, cohabitating or not, uh, and maybe they would consider marriage, but for this significant uh, benefits cut. What's interesting about that uh, and is that there are consequences to not getting married. As we know, marriage matters. Why does it matter? Social Security spousal benefits. I work with some low-income taxpayers who have not gotten married, and one of them is, is staying at home, taking care of the kids. The other is the worker. That uh, taxpayer who's staying at home is not going to get any Social Security benefits because they're not married. Not only will they not get Social Security benefits, but they also won't get Medicare. So that person will hit senior citizenship without Social Security, without Medicare, even though they, they have a partner. So marriage does matter. We're also seeing in Social Security, when you look at elder poverty, uh, Dorothy Brown has written about the fact that marriage in African-American communities is less likely. And uh, African American women are less likely to have a 10 year marriage. You need a 10 year marriage to get social, spouse, social security spousal benefits if you're no longer married. And so that is, as Tony Infante has written about, that's kind of looking at traditional marriage that perhaps doesn't exist so much anymore. Um, what's interesting about the 10 year marriage requirement it used to be 25 years before you would get uh, spousal benefits, and that has changed as society has changed, so maybe it's time to change the 10-year requirement. But we're worried about the aging population of African-American women who aren't going to have that 10-year um, uh, spousal benefit. All right. I actually got an email from one of our wonderful listeners. Oh, should I, an email question. And this is uh, a listener who's going to be moving to Oregon. And she was asking if there are any other programs like the great program we have at UNLV, a low income taxpayer clinic. And I'm very proud to say that there are over a hundred, maybe 125 or so low-income taxpayer clinics across the country, one in every state except Hawaii. Uh, we're working on that. And if anyone out there wants to start one, send me an email. Or in North Dakota, North Dakota doesn't have one, and Puerto Rico also doesn't have one. But these low-income taxpayer clinics are funded, typically, not all of them, but they're funded by a federal grant that comes through the Taxpayer Advocate Service, and that's a wonderful program, and you can get up to $100,000 if you match, and Nina Olson, who's the next National Taxpayer Advocate who's retiring at the end of this month, she has been just legendary in starting these, and they provide access to tax justice, which now is anti-poverty relief. So the IRS has a great website that's a map. Just click on there for your state, and you'll get the address and contact information for the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. In addition, to give another shout out to Nina Olson, she and Les Book, who's a law professor at Villanova, have just put together a great uh, earned income tax credit 
volume that's lengthy and extensive to talk about how we can make the earned income tax credit better and address some things like the marriage penalty and some of the complexity. Thank you. Well, do any of you have ideas or do you know if there are ideas brewing out there for improvements to any of the provisions of the Tax Cuts Jobs Act? Is Congress considering anything? Well, Come I mean, I, go ahead. No, Derek. I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I could say that there seems to be a bold agenda that's uh, creeping up, whether through taxes or in general. Um, and uh, that I suspect is in part, at least somewhat reactionary to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which has further solidified a, a growing unequal America. So I, I think there is indeed a, a political response and this political response is addressing power. A lot of this conversation that we're having today is really about power. The ways in which the tax code um, inhibits or facilitates corporate power, public power, people power, um, the role that race and stratification plays in that, in that relationship of power. A lot of this is about narratives and the way that, that uh, we address things. So I, I think a granular approach needs to be kept in mind. Right now, the tax cut, even with things like the EITC um, and child tax credit, as uh, Francine pointed out, which is relying on whether people are working and actually have children, well, that's even enhancing the power of corporations. I'm not anti-EITC or child tax credits, um, but doing it by work uh, certainly facilitates corporations because it, it um, <laughs> It enhances their power because it relies on people having to go to work. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, other policies that are coming out, people are talking about federal job guarantee. So that would be a use of public power to directly facilitate individuals with jobs so that they can um, have another source, a viable alternative that whether they're working through the public se sector or not, they have an, a public option that even allows those in the private sector to better be able to negotiate and bargain for better conditions because they're not reliant on the, the corporations do not have that threat of unemployment by which workers would be able to take anything. I know we're running out of time. Let me just mention even one other thing. We've been talking about taxes as an outcome, um, but also the role that taxes play as an income. Francine talked a lot about Dorothy Brown's work around the marriage penalty and its racial impact. Well, we should even think about the ways in which our tax system and our inequality in general affects marriages amongst the black community. The fact that we have so many incarcerated men um, in the black community, uh, that certainly has an impact on especially young women and their, uh, uh, the, the sex ratios of unmarried black men to black women, which will impact marriages. Uh, but yet we have a narrative about uh, why don't they marry more? Well, there are structural factors that might inhibit black communities. Uh, Francine also talked about the fact that black households rely on, are more likely to rely, black married households are more likely to have two people working in the workforce. Well, um, suppression of wages, both male and female, might have something to do with that, uh, that, that relationship. And then we have a tax code that rewards certain types of household structures relative to others. I think, I'm, I'm, I promise you I'm about to stop, but if we think about the interlinking of power and the tax code and how it plays out in stratification, we might come up with a better alternative that empowers people directly rather than relying on a, a corporate sector by facilitating them and with corporate tax breaks. And I would add to that relying upon wealthy people. I mean, you know, a good example of that is the Opportunity Zone program that's supposed to be helping low-income people. And the idea is to give a gigantic and immediate tax benefit to wealthy investors in these opportunity funds um, with, a, with the idea that eventually they'll invest in these distressed areas and help the communities there. But there's literally nothing in the whole program or in the Treasury guidelines that really says that even to keep track of who's currently there in those areas, 
and how much they're helped as time goes on, nor is there you know, any other kind of requirement about having community input to determine how those areas are developed and improved. Um, and so this notion of giving tax cuts to high income people with the hope that eventually it'll trickle down and somehow help lower income people, it just, it hasn't worked very well in the past and we need to go to something different, the types of approaches that Derek is referring to there, some of which are outside the code, which may involve direct spending outlays as opposed to tax breaks to people in the hope that eventually something will be done. <laughs> Thank you. Unless any of you have further thoughts, I see that it is 1.30 and we really appreciate all of the audience members tuning in for this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Derek and Alex. Appreciate it. Send emails if you have other questions to any of us. We appreciate it.